1906, an unfortunate cow laid down its life for a place in mathematical history. One, two, 264, 417. The cow was the subject of a guess the weight competition at a village fair. The lucky person who came closest would win the slaughtered animal's meat. 1,020. 2,130. The amazing thing was nobody guessed correctly. And yet, everybody got it right. 4,510. To show you how they did it, I'm not going to use a cow. I'm going to use a jar of jelly beans. 450. 800. 12,000. 7,000. How many jelly beans do you think there are in this jar? Um, 50, uh, 80,000. 80,000? No, actually, 50,000. 50,000? Yeah. OK, 50, yeah, OK. It's incredibly difficult for anyone to guess how many jelly beans there are. I asked 160 people, and most were way off the mark. Everything from 400 right up to 50,000 beans. In fact, only four people got anywhere near the correct answer of 4,510. Plus 1,500, plus 3,273, plus 873, plus... But if I add all the answers together and take the average, I'll get the combined guess of the entire group. Which gives a grand total of 722,383.5. Somebody thought there was half a bean in there. Now, there are 160 guesses made. So let's see how close they are collectively. Wow, that's extraordinary. If you remember, there were 4,510. The average guess to the nearest bean is 4,515. I mean, I thought it'd be close, but I didn't think it'd be that close. That is ridiculous. So although we had guesses that were all over the place, up in 30,000s, right down in the 400s, collectively, we get something which is just 0.1% away from the real number of beans in there. So, as individuals, the guesses are just that, guesses. But when you take them collectively, they become something else entirely. 5,000... What tends to happen is that, more or less, as many people will underestimate the number of jelly beans as overestimate it. A few people will be way off the mark either way, but that doesn't matter. Provided you ask enough people, the errors should cancel each other out. The accuracy of the group is far greater than the individual. We call this the wisdom of the crowd. 160 people is a powerful tool for working out how many jelly beans there are in the jar. But imagine what you could do with a crowd of millions. That's exactly what they use here at Google. With access to over 2 billion web searches a day, Google have found a way of tapping into the wisdom of the biggest crowd on Earth. And by doing so, they've been able to reveal the forces that control our lives and harness them to make predictions about us. Think of all the things that people might search for on a daily basis. Um, think of the things that you might search for on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I, I've searched for a couple of cities in Mexico and films <laughs> in Hackney today. Lots of people may be searching for the similar, a similar thing, movies in Hackney, for example. Um, and you could see, if you looked at that query over the past three years, um, what the pattern of searches for that term looked like. Google had a hunch they could use all our searches to make predictions about our lives. 
They wanted to see if they could match the pattern of certain searches with events in the real world. Google began by seeing if they could predict outbreaks of flu. So flu has a nice seasonal pattern. And because it has that pattern every year, over many years, we're able to, to take that trend and say which search queries match that pattern. So we built a database that included over 50 million different search terms. 50 million? Yes. Wow. Yeah. We didn't only include things that may be related to flu. We included things like, like Britney Spears or, um, I mean, everything that people search for would have been included. When Google looked back over the past five years of data, there were certain search terms whose popularity exactly matched the pattern of flu cases. So people were searching for things like symptoms or medications or sore throat. There are other things like complications. So you're saying that uh, the sort of number of search terms for flu-related things almost exactly mirrors the actual cases of flu that we see in the population? That's true. It is an accurate indicator of, of flu activity, just based on lots of people searching for these terms. We were amazed by this finding. As soon as they see this pattern of search terms, Google can predict there'll be an outbreak of flu, often before people have even gone to the doctor. This is the extraordinary power of the code. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. The searches we make can be used to predict where we're going to go on holiday, what model of car we're going to buy, or how we're going to vote. Often before we know ourselves, it's even been possible to forecast the movement of the stock market from the number of negative words used on Twitter. Analyzing such vast amounts of data doesn't just allow us to make predictions. It can also tell us something fundamental about ourselves. You look out at a city like this, and it looks like, you know, some arbitrary jumbled mess. Yet, the city is people. It's not actually the buildings and the streets. They're the stage upon which the real actors are playing out the story of civilization. Jeffrey West is a physicist who spent his life trying to see meaningful patterns in the universe. And now he's turned his attention to the dynamics of human life in cities. So you can see there's all kinds of infrastructure here. There's the obvious, the roads, the electrical lines, the sewer lines. They're an extraordinary network that is sustaining New York City. You know, coming at it as a physicist, I had this hunch that there is really an underlying code to all this. West amassed data about cities all over the world. And the patterns he found mean that for any given population size, he can predict the amount of roads, electrical wiring, or office space that city has. But he also discovered something much more surprising. One of the most interesting results we discovered was that um, wages scale in a very systematic way. And the rule that came out was that if you double the size of the city, you get this marvelous 15% increase in yeah. the wages. So if you live in a larger city, that means you're going to earn more? Yes. So if there were, there are two so, mathematicians in two different cities, what? one twice the size, <laughs> they're doing the same job, one will actually have a bigger income. That is what the, on the average, that is what the data say. So was that a surprise to you to yeah, see Yeah, that, that was a huge surprise. My first reaction was there's something wrong with the data. And then it was like, my God, of course that's right. That's why cities exist. Incredibly, it's not just people's salaries that increase. When a city doubles in size, 
every measure of social and economic activity goes up by 15% per person. That's 15% more restaurants to choose from, 15% more art galleries to visit, 15% more shops to go to. In short, life gets 15% better. You know, it looks like magic, some yeah, magic, like it's a magic formula that we as social human beings have discovered. This 15% bonus, so to speak, is, I believe, the reason that people are attracted to cities and why there has been this continuous migration from the countryside and into the cities. And at some deeper level, actually drive our civilization. According to Jeffrey West, humankind has an ultimate number. It's this extra 15%, or 1.15. He believes it's the most important driving force in humanity. This single number, 1.15, predicts our future. It will bring us together in ever-expanding cities and shape our destiny for as long as human beings exist. Five hundred years ago, when faced with an eclipse, many of us would have believed it was the work of an angry god. But as we've unearthed the language of the code, we've discovered that the apparent mysteries of our world can be understood without invoking the supernatural. And this, for me, is what's so remarkable, that despite the incredible complexity of the world we live in, it can all ultimately be explained by numbers. Just like the orbit of the planets, life, too, follows a pattern. And it can all be reduced to cause and effect. In the end, even the flip of a coin is determined by how fast it's spinning and how long it takes to hit the ground. The ultimate symbol of chance isn't random at all. It only appears that way. When we don't understand the code, the only way we can make sense of our world is to make up stories. But the truth is far more extraordinary. Everything has mathematics at its heart. When everything is stripped away, all that remains is the code.